From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, I'm David Weston. Welcome now to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. We want to start, as we do every day pretty much, with a check on the markets. Joining us, Abigail Doolittle. So what are the markets telling us today, if anything, Abigail? You know, lots of uncertainty still, David. That's been the theme all year, and certainly as we've been getting, getting closer to the election. And I say that because we've been flip-flopping between gains and losses on the day. Stocks started out about dead flat, and then we had the major averages up half a percent not so long ago down three tenths of one percent then up now down slightly so investors undecided on the macro picture but from an earnings level perspective we're seeing some of that too some companies beating but we're also having some misses such as netflix Netflix uh, down sharply. They, of course, their subscriber views uh, miss. So there seems to be some fatigue. People are talking about pandemic fatigue, so perhaps Netflix fatigue. But on the other hand, David, lots of strength for the internet and social media names because Snap put up a, a good quarter. So there is uh, one bright spot, and that is the uh, FANG complex for those internet stocks popping sharply higher, even with Netflix there in the mix. So, so Abigail, at the same time, when the equity markets don't tell us necessarily a clear picture, sometimes we look at things like like debt, look at the, uh, the, the tenure, for example, yield on U.S. government debt, but also the dollar. Is there some thought that, in fact, stimulus may come, and is that affecting the dollar and also debt? Uh, absolutely, David, and I think that that's probably the bigger driver on the day. When we take a look at ten -year, the 10-year ten yield bonds, we have bonds lower. That tells us the yields are climbing higher, and right now you have the 10-year yield starting to pop out of the middle of a range above 80 basis points. Should that continue, and it seems likely they probably press up closer to 1%. And of course, that is coming on the narrative that stimulus is around the corner at some point. But then the idea that uh, you will have, uh, you know, yields continuing to climb. At what point does that spook investors uh, for a variety of reasons? One guest was saying earlier today it's 1.5%. But back in June, when the 10 year yield was last right around 1%, that was when stocks started to get a little bit of wo wobbly. So that could also be a big piece of. Uh, what we're seeing today, again, on the possibility that stimulus is around the corner. But we've been hearing that for many, many weeks, even months, David, so we'll believe it when we see it. Yeah, we keep talking about it here on Balance of Power. <laughs> Thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle for that report on the markets. We continue now our Swing State series looking at Pennsylvania this week, and we welcome today Congresswoman Chrissy Houlihan. She is 6th Congressional District, lies west of Philadelphia. She represents that district, so con thank you for being with us, Congresswoman. Uh, let's start with your district in particular, and it's relationship, if any, to this stimulus we keep hearing about? How important is it to your constituents? I think it's remarkably important to our constituents. I'm just west of the city of Philadelphia, and we are not dissimilar from the rest of the Commonwealth and the country in that we've been really struggling under the weight of COVID for a very, very long time. And the proverbial uh, saying is true, winter is coming. And I think that our community is very, very concerned and very much needs our government to get along and to respond with another round of stimulus now. We, we talked to Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi yesterday, and she was, I thought, to me, a little surprisingly positive. Uh, it's not done yet. There are issues left. But she actually was quite hopeful, I would say. Are you? I am also hopeful. Uh, the indications and signals that I see coming out of Washington uh, through both leadership of the House and the Senate and the administration are hopeful. Uh, certainly, we have a lot of uh, time still left before the weekend, which seems to be the next deadline. But I'm very hopeful that, that calmer and cooler heads will prevail and we'll be able to get to an agreement. Congresswoman Ahulahan, one of the things we've heard from people in Pennsylvania is how important the suburbs are, uh, and particularly around Philadelphia. You are, as you say, west of Philadelphia. You have some of those suburbs. Give us a sense of where those are going, because four years ago, as I understand it, they helped President Trump actually eke out a victory in Pennsylvania. Exactly. Uh, the women in particular, white women in particular, did vote for President Trump in our area and in other parts of the country. And now it's looking like in our area and in other parts of the country that voting block, as well as all women, are, are swinging the other way and are swinging towards Joe Biden. And that, I believe, is largely because we're exhausted. You know, we've gotten four years of, uh, of an erratic pre presidency, and we've gotten, uh, as a result, we're, you know, hunkered down in our homes with COVID right now. Uh, and so these, these pr primarily 
women, uh, I think have been energized since 2016 and have continued to remain energized throughout the last four years. And we've continued to be uh, participating in, in the democracy. And I'm, I'm hopeful that in just another 13 days, we'll have a different result and a different administration. I'm sure there's a range of issues that really drive people. Let's pick up on the one that you just identified, how the COVID-19 crisis has been handled. What is the consensus, if there is one in your district, about President Trump and how he's handled it? And for that matter, how a President Biden, if he became president, might differ? Sure, and I think that it's uh, our area is a pretty uh, a sophisticated voter, I would say. Uh, we are fairly well educated and fairly well informed, and we believe in science. Uh, and this administration hasn't really uh, led by that and hasn't led with the science. First and foremost, we need to be addressing this, this disease. And that's kind of the, the first line of attack, because none of us will feel safe going back into our schools or our businesses or, or being customers uh, until that. And so that has been something that has really been absent from this administration. And I very much believe that a Biden administration would lead from that first, following the science and making sure that we have a national testing strategy and a national response plan to this disease so that the other things like COVID stimulus aren't as necessary. So, so Congresswoman, we remember President Trump became president largely on an economic message. We're going to have growth. We're going to add jobs. Uh, and the economy was doing well uh, for at least the first three years of his administration, I think. He now says that's the only thing that threw him off. Did your constituents feel the economy was doing well before the pandemic hit? So largely our community was doing well uh, ostensibly and superficially. We did have a very low unemployment rate, but that as you can see with the COVID uh, re response was just superficial in many ways. Many of us uh, didn't have very deep savings. Many of us aren't invested in the stock market. And so uh, although we were uh, well employed and uh, we were not necessarily secure. And I think one of the most important things a government can do and this administration can do is make sure to take care of its uh, citizenry. Uh, and you can't kind of caveat a strong uh, economy by saying, except for the pandemic that, that crushed and killed us all. Uh, and that seems to be the, the narrative that this, this president is trying to get us to buy into. Well, and one of the part of that narrative is basically I did it once I can do it again. Are people in your district, do they tend to accept that? I mean, do they trust President Trump more than they trust uh, Vice President Biden, as he has been former vice president, with the economy? I don't believe so. I believe that the data says that the that our community is sort of equal, split equally on the issue of the economy. But certainly, you know, we had had put our trust in this administration. Uh, and although they de delivered a, a, an economy that it was useful for some, it wasn't, as we mentioned, useful for uh, everyone. Uh, some of this administration uh, has not done anything, for instance, on living wage or raising the minimum wage or equal pay for equal work or any of those kinds of things that will allow all of us to be successful in this e economy and not just the most successful amongst us. Congressman, I want to ask you about the military because you serve on the House Armed Forces Committee. Uh, there's been some back and forth about what President Trump's relationship is with the military. Some people say he has problems at the top, but not in the rank and file. What is your impression? Because you're, part of your oversight is of the military. Sure. And I also am a veteran and my dad and my grandfather served full careers in the military as well. I have several active duty cousins right now. And I, I believe that you can't uh, kind of as a monolith categorize all active duty members or veterans. But I can say that uh, the, the Biden platform, the Biden approach is much more aligned with how I and my family perceive uh, the role of, of the military and our leadership, which is to be uh, put country over party, to put country over self. Uh, and I believe very much that this administration and this uh, and this leader, uh, President Trump, has not done that. Uh, in fact, of course, he's maligned, you know, a, a gold star families. Uh, he has called us uh, foolish and stupid for having served. Uh, he himself did not serve. Uh, and I think that that is not the example that we would like to see in our leadership. And I think, importantly, the, the Democratic platform is also something that talks about putting uh, putting country over, over self uh, and leaving no man behind. Uh, and this is certainly where we, we need to be right now, particularly in this pandemic situation. Congressman, that was very helpful. Really appreciate your time today. That's Congresswoman Chrissy Houlihan, Democrat of Pennsylvania. And make sure to stay with Bloomberg for our full coverage of the final presidential debate. That will start tomorrow night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Coming up here, NATO defense ministers are meeting this week, and we go over the agenda with the U.S. ambassador to NATO, Kay Bailey Hutchison. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We turn now to Mark Crumpton for Bloomberg First Word News. David, thank you. The UK has agreed to restart Brexit trade talks with the European Union. The first phase of negotiations will take place in London beginning tomorrow. The two sides are reportedly hoping to reach a deal by the middle of November. The White House wants a deal on a coronavirus package with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi in the next 48 hours. As David and Congresswoman Houlihan were discussing just moments ago, President Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, told Fox Business the last 24 hours have moved the ball down the field. But even if there is an agreement, there's no guarantee that Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell will bring it to a vote on the floor. Milan, the financial capital of Italy, will be under a nighttime curfew beginning tomorrow. Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte is also considering new nationwide measures to contain the renewed spread of COVID-19. Officials say new curbs being considered include closing gyms and swimming pools, limiting weekend hours for shopping centers, and shifting more schools to remote learning. Pope Francis is endorsing same-sex civil unions for the first time. His comments came as the Pope was being interviewed for the feature-length documentary Francesco, which premiered at the Rome Film Festival today. During the interview, Francis said there needs to be a civil union law so same-sex couples are legally covered. The pontiff had endorsed same-sex civil unions when he was the Archbishop of Buenos Aires, but this is his first time publicly supporting them as Pope. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thank you so much, Mark. NATO defense ministers begin their fall meeting tomorrow, but this time it will be virtual instead of taking place physically in Brussels. For a preview of what is to be discussed, we welcome now the U.S. representative to NATO. She is Ambassador Kay Bailey Hutchison. So, Madam Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us. Give us your sense of the, of the agenda, and I dare say I bet the pandemic response is going to be on that agenda. Oh, definitely, David. That's what everyone is dealing with in Europe as well as the United States. And NATO came up with a plan that the defense ministers in June actually uh, put in place so that we would have help for allies if there was a second wave. Unfortunately, we are seeing the second wave right now. And so we are beginning to disperse to some of these countries that have an uptick, and that is most of the countries in Europe. And uh, just for instance, David, uh, the U.S. put 200 ventilators into our stockpile that was part of our NATO plan, and those ventilators are now being distributed right now to Albania, Montenegro, and North Macedonia. Uh, we have a trust fund that is coming forward as well to help where countries don't have some of the supplies they need, and we have transportation capabilities that are coordinated through NATO. So we are working together as allies in this COVID-19, just as we do in our security umbrella um, in, in times of stress and need. At this point, Madam Ambassador, is it affecting NATO readiness at all? It is not, because we have put readiness and security right at the top of our priority list. And we have said we don't want a health crisis to turn into a security crisis. Our adversaries are not letting down, and neither are we. So we are keeping our forces ready. We're keeping them rotating in Europe, just as they have been. And we are training. We're doing our missions in Afghanistan and Iraq. And uh, we're not letting up one bit. I'm glad you raised that, Madam Ambassador, because some of us lose track of it, believe it or not. What is the NATO role in Afghanistan and in Iraq right now? Well, let, let me say in Afghanistan that this is in response to our 9-11 attack. And NATO, for the first and only time, has invoked Article 5, which says if one of us is attacked, we're all attacked. So our NATO allies are with us in Afghanistan to keep terrorism from building up and being exported to our countries ever again. And 
because we are there, we are supporting the Afghan people uh, who are now uh, meeting with the Taliban uh, to try to come to terms for a peace agreement that would make a, a stable government in, a, in Afghanistan that would be uh, supported by the people, that would protect the human rights and the rights of women, uh, that would uh, be able to settle Afghanistan and assure that terrorist groups cannot build again. And that is the NATO mission along with the United States right now in Afghanistan. And we are uh, supporting the Afghan peace process in the hopes that at some point uh, we will be able to leave Afghanistan and they will be able to fully function on their own. Madam Ambassador, as you talk about the response to the pandemic uh, operations in Afghanistan and Iraq, all of this costs money. Uh, tell us about the budget for NATO and particularly the contributions from the various parties. That has been a hot issue, as you know, with the United States and members of NATO for a while now. Yes, uh, all of us are trying to hold up the commitment that we have made to spend 2% of our gross domestic product on defense. And 10 of our countries have stepped up and are meeting the 2% goal. And we are going in the right direction to increase that uh, as we move forward. Because we cannot be a legitimate deterrent alliance for any adversary that might uh, think that they can attack or take over sovereign territory for any of our allies. And we are standing up for security, not to let down on defense spending, because we don't want uh, to let our adversaries think that we are lessening our resolve on the defense and security side. So our our defense budgets are continuing to increase because, and let me make a second point about that. Of course, we're holding our defenses for deterrent capabilities. But the other thing that we're doing in defense spending, it has been so helpful in this COVID crisis. It is the military management that has come to the fore to help in this domestic crisis. So. The military training, setting up hospitals, delivering goods, setting up uh, capabilities for help for the medical community that is fighting so hard to, uh, to beat this virus and all the people who are affected. So our military spending has been an asset for our domestic needs. So we are continuing to push our allies to increase the spending on defense, and that is also being used for our joint efforts to help our allies that are suffering from a second wave of COVID. Madam Ambassador, as the NATO defense ministers meet, there is a hot spot over there, not in NATO, but adjoining it. And I wonder how that's going to be addressed by this meeting. You have the conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia that Turkey, a member of NATO, has become involved in, allegedly, and even some conflicts within NATO between France and Turkey, reportedly. As I understand it, the president of Armenia is asked even to address the NATO defense ministers. How are you going to address that very sensitive issue? It is sensitive, David, just as you said. Uh, having allies uh, get involved in other conflicts or draw uh, tension with other allies it has uh, certainly become something that we have tried to avoid. I will say in the situation with Nagorno-Karabakh uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan, it's been very difficult because they're both partners of NATO. As you know, we have 30 allies, but we have 40 partners that, that speak with one voice with us for security measures. Both Armenia and Azerbaijan are uh, partners with NATO, so we, we don't want to take sides, but we are urging both sides to have a ceasefire and to go to the Minsk group uh, to settle the underlying issues here. The reason that uh, the, the fight is happening is because of a 30-year dispute about the borders of Azerbaijan 
uh, within which is a very large Armenian population. And the, that happened after the Cold War uh, and the breakup of the Soviet Union, and the lines were drawn, and it has been a simmering conflict for a long time. If we can settle the issues of the sovereign rights and the dealing with this very large uh, Armenian population within Azerbaijan's territory, uh, that is what will settle these tensions. And what we're trying to do at NATO is say, this conflict cannot be settled with conflict of like war uh, mm -hmm. or arms or killing people. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's going to have to be settled with the Minsk group. Right. Now, the Minsk group is co-chaired right. by U.S., Russia, and France. Yeah. And we're calling on both Armenia right. and Azerbaijan to come to the table right. and talk with these three co-chairs or right. add new co-chairs if they want to. But anything they can agree on that they would then accept uh, an arbitration right. with is what we are asking them to do. Okay, thank you so very much, Madam Ambassador. Really great to talk with you as always. That's Ambassador Kay Bailey Hutchinson, U.S. Ambassador to NATO. Still ahead, the Hummer is back, but this time it's all electric. We hear from GM President Mark Royce. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We have some breaking news right now. The Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, is appearing on MSNBC, and she says she's pretty happy about the state of relief talks. She says they have a prospect for a stimulus agreement. You remember, we talked with the Speaker yesterday here. She was hopeful, but it sounds like nothing has dimmed that hope, and it may be even getting better. Shortly later on this program, we're going to talk with the Deputy Press Secretary at the White House to get the take from the White House. In the meantime, overnight, GM unveiled what many had been waiting for, an all-new, all-electric version of the home designed for off-road and on-road use and with acceleration that would have been impossible in a combustion engine version. We talked with GM President Mark Royce about where this new Hummer will fit in the marketplace. GMC is really the only premium truck brand out there, if you think about it. Uh, most of the, our competitors are brand extensions for that. So um, we have GMC and we have Hummer uh, in a premium channel um, for, for trucks. And that, that's, a, that's a very uh, distinguishable piece of what we're doing with both brands. Uh, you have the AT, uh, AT4 and the AT4X and things like that for, uh, for GMC. And I think you'll see that, um, that grow. But then you have um, the, Hummer, you know, uh, the Hummer model under the GMC umbrella as well, which is sort of the ultimate off-road uh, piece of that. So uh, very carefully um, designed and executed with different um, attributes, different designs, and different go-to-market strategies. Mark, you mentioned competitors. Let's talk about competitors in the EV space. You have Ford now with an F-150 EV they've announced. You've got, of course, Tesla with their pickup truck. How does this compare, this Hummer EV? Are they direct competitors against that? Are you going for a somewhat different market? I think it's like nothing else, and, and I'll leave it at that. It, th this truck is, is very different um, from what um, our competitors have described um, uh, most recently with um, the, the EV piece of the light duty pickup truck and then um, uh, a few, uh, uh, quite a few months back with um, what, what the other um, electric only competitor is doing with their truck. And I don't, um, I don't really know uh, until we see those come into the marketplace what those trucks are, but I can tell you what this is and this is right now um, like nothing else. Talk about what maybe a sister truck, the Badger from Nikola. GM obviously announced a fairly large arrangement with Nikola. A lot of controversy around it. Is the Badger going forward? Do you see that as something complementary to what you're doing with the Humber EV? Well, you know, we won't sell and market that truck. That'll be um, Nikola's, uh, that, that, that's what Nikola's doing. And the big difference there is that truck will, will have a fuel cell. And so if it, it's still a fuel cell electric truck but quite different what we're offering with our LT packs um, on the pure electric Hummer. So um, very different. But as far as you know, the, the Badger and the Nikola deal is going forward. Right now we are going forward. And so um, the, the exciting piece of this is they're taking what is, um, I believe, the best fuel cell in the world with our fuel cell uh, that is uh, made uh, in our joint venture with Honda right here in, in Michigan. 
um, and taking that fuel cell and looking at deploying it um, in the heavy duty transport market uh, with the large um, trucks, you know, the, 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 the class seven and eights, and then um, also in the light duty uh, Badger truck that you mentioned, so yes. So with the Hummer EV, put this in the larger context of General Motors and its move into electric vehicles. You've announced the Lyric, the Cadillac Lyric. Now you have the Hummer EV. As I understand it, there's a Bolt EUV coming out as well. How does this fit into the overall portfolio that you're developing and what comes next? That's a, that's a great question. If you look at um, the way we've uh, uh, designed the platforms, both on the, the truck platform, our BET, battery electric truck platform, and then our our battery electric vehicle um, uh, platform, those two dedicated platforms are quite different. Um, and that approach is quite different than many others um, that are, that are inter introducing electric vehicles. The reason why I say that is because, again, we're deploying um, you know, our modular uh, pack, our LTM battery source um, out of our Lordstown plant in Ohio. Um, that is designed and executed to be high volume. And the reason why that's important, again, for the customer and for, um, uh, for the market is because we can uh, really take, um, because of scale and chemistry that we've developed. In fact, right here, uh, we have a chemistry developing lab for our cells and our packs right here at the Tech Center in Warren, Michigan. Um, that quick development of chemistry and then deploying that chemistry into our LTM packs is really um, the secret behind uh, you know, driving that cost down so that we can offer not only Hummers and Cadillacs, but Bolt EUVs and beyond for the mass market piece um, of, of our other brands um, that do higher volume and right in the heart of the market like Chevrolet um, and, and you know, Chevrolet crossovers, trucks, um, all of those vehicles. And so this has been really, um, really done very carefully. And that, that goes also into the electric motors that we're doing ourselves. That was GM President Mark Royce on the all-new Hummer EV coming out at the end of next year. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. The UK is taking more steps to fight the coronavirus pandemic. Prime Minister Boris Johnson has expanded the areas that will fall under the tightest virus restrictions. Speaking in London, Prime Minister Johnson said he is focused on local restrictions as opposed to a national lockdown so that we all, and particularly those regions that are now, alas, under tier three restrictions, all the regions of the country bounce back strongly together. The restrictions on South Yorkshire come a day after the Prime Minister imposed similar measures on Greater Manchester, following the breakdown of talks with local leaders over the scale of financial assistance. Canadian lawmakers are considering the creation of a special committee to investigate potential misuse of COVID-19 spending. That's prompted Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to threaten a snap election. Prime Minister Trudeau could face a backlash from Canadians who are suffering through a second wave of COVID-19 and may have little patience for political infighting. COVID-19 has taken a well-documented toll on the education of America's children, but experts say it also poses a threat to their nutrition. In a typical year, the government helps feed almost 30 million students a day, or about one in two. Now, because of COVID-19, most districts are delivering less than half as many meals as usual. Officials say that's contributing to an alarming increase in child hunger, as food banks around the country report soaring demand. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Thanks so much, Mark. We're going to stay on the subject of COVID-19 because there's some breaking news now. Just a short time ago, we learned that New York State is reporting over 2,000 new COVID-19 cases for the first time since last May. The positivity rate in hotspots, including parts of Brooklyn, Queens, and Rockland County, was up to 6.6 percent. And for more on that, we turn to our colleague now, Michael McKee. So, Mike, this is not up to the levels of June, but it's heading in a bad direction right now, it feels like. It's heading a bad direction, and the problem is this is community spread, and this is what everybody has been worried about. We've seen it in other states, and we've seen it most recently in Connecticut and New Jersey. Governor Cuomo saying he wanted to work with those two states 
because there's no real way to lock the border between them since so many people commute, particularly into New York City. The concerns are still based in terms of New York City around the borough of Manhattan. They're in Brooklyn and Queens particularly, but also, the governor said, along the Pennsylvania border. So we're starting to see upticks in other places. Uh, Manhattan's gotten a little bit worse. About a week ago, the infection rate was about half a percent. It's now up to almost uh, 1%. And so we are seeing the spread of COVID again in New York, which had been one of the better states out there. And so at this point, it looks like nobody is immune. Well, Michael, obviously the question that all of us have in mind is, okay, what does that mean? What's to be done about it? We heard from the governor yesterday saying, look, at, he's fighting the COVID-19. He's also fighting to try to reopen the economy. Are we talking about lockdowns, do you think? Well, what they've they've already done some lockdowns, David, of course, in Brooklyn in particular, where they uh, forced bars and restaurants to close except for uh, home delivery in certain neighborhoods and also restricted the number of people who could gather together, even at churches. And that may be coming for other parts of the city and other parts of the state. They would prefer to do that than to impose the kind of general lockdown that we saw come in in March. It did enormous damage to the New York City economy, and we still haven't recovered as people can go back to work. They're finding a lot of places didn't reopen. Yeah, exactly right. You can see that right around our offices here at Bloomberg. Thank you so much to our colleague, Michael McKee. We want to turn back to stimulus now. Yesterday, we talked with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi about her hopes for getting another round of stimulus done before the election. And she is even today on MSNBC said she's things are looking good. But now we want to go to the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue and welcome White House Deputy Press Secretary Brian Morgenstern. Brian, thank you very much for being with us and thank you for your patience there. Give us your perspective from the White House. Are you happy with the way things are going, the way Nancy Pelosi says she is? Well, look, I think today we've got reason for a little more optimism than, we'd, than we've had in recent days. I think the parties are actually talking, exchanging ideas. We're seeing the speaker move uh, maybe in ways that she hasn't over the course of the last 90 days. The administration has remained consistently in support of paycheck protection, funds for small businesses, funding to get schools open, stimulus checks for hardworking Americans, unemployment insurance help. Uh, we're kind of having that conversation about liability protections and on uh, onshoring manufacturing. Uh, really a more robust discussion. The chief will be on the Hill uh, talking with senators today, uh, seeing how far we can move the ball down the field. The speaker and the secretary, uh, Stephen Mnuchin, will speak again this afternoon. Uh, I think both sides are rightfully projecting a little bit of optimism compared to where we have been over the past several months because the speaker really was unwilling to move, and it seems like we're coming a little bit closer together. Well, and Brian, I don't want to get in the middle of this negotiation. I won't do that, but I will say that the speaker yesterday on the question of liability indicated there is some middle ground. It was not an all-or-nothing proposition if it's limited to COVID-19, but the other bookend, as she called it, was actually state and local assistance. Where are we on that? So we're still, we still have differences there. Uh, the estimates that uh, uh, our folks have been looking at in terms of what the state and local governments would need uh, as a result of losses from the COVID virus, we're looking at 250, 275 billion in that range. The speaker is still far, far above that. And the president still believes that we should not be spending money on things that literally have nothing to do with COVID. So that's it remains an area of disagreement, uh, but the conversations are happening. And as I, I, I've, I've said, I think over the next 48 hours or so, uh, we'll see how things play out. But today, it seems to be it was an optimistic morning and it remains an optimistic <laughs> afternoon as, as talks continue. Uh, Brian, we're up a little bit of a deadline with the election coming 13 days from now. Although the speaker yesterday said, yeah. you know what, we could also do it after that. I'd like to do it before we could do it after. Is President Trump committed to getting this stimulus done? Because he said he wants stimulus and he wants to be big, even if it goes after the election. Yes, yeah, so that is an option. And the Treasury Secretary said uh, something similar uh, recently. And so, look, getting it done, we've wanted to get it done for the past, I think it's 92, 93 days uh, at this point. But, but there's sort of a, you know, we can't do it at all costs. We have to have some bounds of reasonability here. We have to be actually addressing problems facing the American people, keeping people connected to their jobs, ensuring adequate liquidity uh, when they face problems due to the coronavirus. 
Uh, but if, if things drift past the election, you know, we're not going to stop talking. Um, but uh, we've always wanted to get it done. As I said, over the last 92 days, we, we continue to want to get it done as soon as possible. And are people working around the clock over a treasure that behind yeah. you there at the White House? Are people working around the clock to get this done? Oh, absolutely. These things have not stopped. Uh, the secretary, of course, has been on a tour through the Middle East, and he's continued to have these conversations, even as he is literally halfway around the world. Uh, our chief, Mark Meadows, remains engaged. Uh, conversations ongoing uh, with our staff and the Hill, uh, making sure, you know, as you know, David, I think uh, sometimes negotiations like this are a bit of a game of whack-a-mole. When you move in one direction, part of one caucus may go in the other. So you have to kind of, you know, uh, maintain the glue to keep everybody together. Uh, we are continuing to use our best efforts to try and do that. As I said, to, to emphasize the administration's priorities of keeping people who work for small businesses connected to their jobs, stimulus checks for adequate liquidity, unemployment insurance. The president has taken uh, unilateral actions with his executive order. Those won't last forever. We will need help from Congress, and of course, we want it as soon as we can get it. Brian, a lot of us, you and we, are really focused on stimulus, but there are other issues as well pending. We do have the election coming up. Give me your sense as your position at, as a White House spokesperson. What is the message for going into this election that you want to get across to the American people? What's the central message? Yeah. So, President Trump is the jobs president. His agenda of tax cuts, uh, deregulation, improved trade deals, uh, unleashing America's energy sector has led to the large, the strongest, most inclusive con economy we've seen. His, resp his response to the coronavirus of getting treatments and a vaccine to market in record time, using the Defense Production Act to get PPP, uh, excuse me, PPE all around the country, reducing the risks of the virus so that we can safely reopen. He wants again, the strongest and most inclusive economy. The other side, we're looking at draconian tax increases, potentially more lockdowns. Uh, the data is just not supporting that. We're not seeing spread in workplaces and schools. We can reopen in a safe way because President Trump has taken unprecedented steps to put us in this position, and his economic agenda is going to lead to more jobs and higher wages for the American people and less wars and more peace deals than the previous administration. So uh, definitely a safer and more prosperous way of life. Uh, Brian, I know firsthand that no matter how much you want to control a message, sometimes it gets out away from you and it's hard to really control it. Uh, I want to talk about, just for one moment, the Leslie Stahl 60 sure. Minutes thing. Uh, I've been involved in some of those, uh, those uh, uh, interviews. Sometimes they go well, sometimes they don't. Clearly it didn't come out the way you wanted. What happened? <laughs> well, I, look, I think the president's actually uh, quite proud of it. He likes to joust. He enjoys hostile interviews. Uh, he wants to make sure that he gets a fair shake, that there isn't uh, some deceptive editing going on. And so I think he wants to make sure that the whole thing's out there, that his fulsome answers are reported, uh, because he's quite proud of them. He doesn't want to be misportrayed. So I think that's really what this is about, is holding the press accountable uh, and making sure that the reporting is accurate and fairly representing his answers. Okay, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time today, Brian. That's Brian Morgenstern, a very busy White House Deputy Pre Press Secretary. Tomorrow night is the second and last presidential debate before the election, 13 days from right now, with President Trump looking to make up what looks like some lost ground in the polls, if they're to be believed. We welcome now one of the few who has actually been on the debate stage with former Vice President Biden. He is Tom Steyer, who ran against Mr. Biden for the nomination. He is the founder of Farallon Capital, as well as the nonprofit Next Gen America and so many other things. And we welcome him now back to Bloomberg. Tom, thank you so much for being with us. Start with the debate. What is it to like to debate against Joe Biden? What did advice would you have for Joe Biden as he goes into the debate tomorrow night? Well, David, I think that Joe Biden is a very calm, confident debater. I think he comes through as what he is, which is somebody who really cares about the American people. He doesn't get too complicated. He sticks to his basic points, and he comes through as a very caring individual. So I think that from the standpoint of the debate stage, he won the first debate with Mr. Trump hands down. And I think it was a huge plus for the campaign because he kept his cool. He kept his, his uh, awareness of the facts. And he just did a great job. And I'm expecting something similar tomorrow night. Okay, so I'm sure you don't have time to watch Saturday Night Live. But if you did last Saturday actually portrayed uh, Vice President Biden as sort of Mr. Rogers, is that a com comfortable position? By the way, is that a bad position for him to be taking right now, given what's going on across this debate stage for him? 
Well, I think that the idea, I think when you say Mr. Rogers, you know, wearing that very comforting sweater, you have a candidate who first and foremost relates to the American people, whose policies are really a reflection of his caring for and confidence in the brains and the hard work of Americans. So I think that that attitude that we're going to have the exact opposite of Mr. Trump, that we're going to have an experienced, caring uh, person who's going to rely on experts and make decisions based on the facts is going to be a sea change in a very good way for America. And I think that that comes across on the debate stage, and it's very reassuring and positive. Tom, last time you were here, we spent a fair amount of time talking about the wildfires in, in California. I really want to know, what's the status of those now? I mean, they were tragic, really historic. What's going on with the wildfires right now? Well, we've moved past the worst part of it by far David, and the air is clear back in California. And so, you know, it's important to remember, though, that the news on climate from around the world is terrible. You know, yes, we've had more than double any fire, you know, in terms of acreage burned in California this year. We've had a record number of storms in the Gulf, record number. We have news coming from the polls about sea rise and about uh, the melting of the permafrost that's very threatening. So there's no question that we have an absolute need to deal with this urgently. And to be clear, Joe Biden's plan does deal with this so-called Build Back Better plan, does deal with this urgently. And it's a place where the difference between Joe Biden and Donald Trump is enormous. The gulf couldn't be bigger. We have a candidate who is dealing with science, acknowledging it, and then coming up with a plan that doesn't just deal with climate, but creates millions of good paying union jobs and deals with environmental justice, you know, part of the systemic racism in our society, versus a candidate who literally can't admit to the problem, just as he couldn't, he can't deal with COVID, he has no plan. You know, this is the urgency of climate is a perfect re example of the difference between this candidates, these candidates and is a perfect reason about why we're going to have historic turnout in America this year because Americans realize we're at a turning point and we right. absolutely have to choose the positive right. future-oriented path that Joe Biden's laying out. There's just no question about it. Tom, finally, talk to me about the California economy. I know you've been on the panel that Governor Newsom really appointed to get the economy open again. It's not been a straight path, I think. I was really taken aback by the fact that the Walt Disney Company now is really objecting to the way that it's being handled. Bob Iger, at one point, I think, was on the panel with you. He's the executive chairman of Walt Disney Company. What's going on there? Because Disney's saying, look, they let us open in Orlando, but not out in Anaheim. Well, I think what's going on is that Governor Newsom made the determine and I th determination, and I think it's right, that for us to get the robust recovery we want, we need to get the virus under control. And that means that there are protocols and rules about all the different um, businesses and industries in terms of when you get to open a restaurant and when you get to open a gymnasium and when you get to open a school and when you get to open a theme park. And Governor Newsom has stuck to his guns and insisted that we keep Californians safe. And those numbers are very much reflected in the health and safety in, of Californians and how he's protected them. And so the bet has been from the beginning, and our, our task force has supported him in this, that first and foremost protect the health and safety of Californians. And then we'll get, because all the data says, then you get the most robust recovery. So it's, you know, his health officials told him that that was a bad thing to do to allow Disneyland to open as soon as the Walt Disney Company would like. And he stuck to his guns and went with health and safety. And I think we're seeing that that's absolutely supported by the level of uh, infection and also the, the death rate. So I think this is another example of where we have a Democratic governor dealing with science, right. putting, caring about the health and safety of right. his constituency and doing the right thing. It's the exact opposite, honestly, of the failed non-response to COVID right. that our president has had, which is no plan, no rules, an actual denial that it even matters or is happening. 
an, a, an attempt to smooth it over. And you can see that around the country, that is a policy which is leading to, you know, spikes in infection rates and spikes in deaths right. that apparently Mr. Trump doesn't care about. Tom, it's always a pleasure as well as really helpful to have you on. That's Tom Steyer. He's the former Democratic presidential candidate and founder of Farallon Capital. And tomorrow, please be sure to tune in for Bloomberg's special coverage of the final presidential debate. That will start at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. Coming up, the mayor of Orlando, Buddy Dyer, on what's going on with his city, with COVID and with the economy. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Florida continues to battle COVID even as it looms large as a factor in the election just 13 days from now. We welcome now the mayor of Orlando, he's Buddy Dyer, for an update on how his city is doing and what he expects on November 3rd. So, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much for being back with us. Appreciate it. First of all, start with COVID. How's it going? Um, we're pressing on. Um, our positive rate's about 5% right now. It's been hovering was a little below, but since we've opened back up, we're in the 5% and a little higher than that. So we're doing pretty well. People are still heating, even though the governor opened the state up, the people in Orange County anyways, in Central Florida, are continuing to wear their masks, continuing to social distance, continuing to do the right things to keep everybody safe. Well, talk about that opening up some. Uh, how much is open? How much success are you having? I know that, for example, Disney World is open back up, limited but open. Yeah, most businesses are open and to a limited extent. They relax the ratios and percentages that restaurants and even bars could have. So we're, you know, waiting to see what the effects will be when we have a total of three weeks where we've been totally open, but people are still taking the appropriate precautions. And I think most restaurant and uh, bar owners are continuing to adhere to a more limited capacity and spacing of uh, tables and that type of stuff. So even though they could be doing things, they're continuing to be cautious and doing the right thing. Here in New York City, we're having something of a resurgence of the COVID-19, I'm sad to say. Uh, do you feel as mayor that you're getting enough data, enough contact tracing to really keep your arms around the problem so it doesn't get out of control? Um, I think we're getting a lot of information. Whether we can continue to control it or not is going to depend on everybody doing what they need to do, which is continuing to wear masks and socially distance, stay home when they can uh, at City Hall we're not going to be open until at least the end of the year. And if I look out, out at the skyline in downtown Orlando, I'm guessing the occupancy in the office buildings are certainly less than 20 percent and maybe significantly less than that right now. So people are still working from home. They're, uh, you know, taking the necessary precautions. So hopefully we won't have a spike. Uh, so, Mr. Mayor, as you know terribly well, 13 days now till the election, give us your sense about how the voters in, in and around Orlando are likely to process the COVID-19, the pandemic, and also the economic aftermath of the response to that. So we had early voting starting on Monday of this week, and there has been record turnout in each of the first couple of days for early voting. So there is certainly an urgency, I think, um, for people wanting to have the ability to exercise their vote. We have uh, 20 early voting locations in the city of, or not in the city of Orlando, in, in Orange County, including for the first time the Amway Center, which is our basketball arena. So there is great interest in change, I think, in this election. Uh, well, uh, to that point of change that you believe there's interest in, uh, what do the voters in and around Orlando think about the way President Trump has handled COVID-19? It certainly will be a major issue, if not the major issue in the election, it appears. Well, I, I think that is the, the major issue, and he has totally mishandled the issue from the very start when they knew what the danger was and he discounted it. Um, he had an interview where he basically said, I'm going to look the other way on this and has continued to feed misinformation. So I think it's fallen on the states and the local governments to do the right thing and handle it in the best way 
that we can, and we've continued to preach wearing masks and social distancing and taking care of each other. And I think at least the people here in Orlando and Orange County have heeded that call. Do you, are you reasonably confident we'll get a clear answer out of Florida at least within a reasonable time after November 3rd? I think you'll have Florida on November 3rd because mm-hmm. we do um, absentee ballots and count them before the polls close on election day. So it's not like you're waiting on that all night long. So we will probably have a pretty good indication, I think, by 9 or 10 o'clock what time, which way the state's going to go. Unfortunately, the last probably three election cycles, it's been narrow within a point and a half or, or less than that on statewide elections in virtually every race. So right now the polls show Biden with a fairly comfortable lead, but that's not the history in Florida. We end up usually having pretty close elections. Finally, just briefly, Mr. Mayor, uh, how badly do you need that stimulus out of Washington? Um, people are hurting. I, as a uh, city government, we're okay. We're, we're not reliant on federal funds or state funds, for that matter. We're largely reliant on property taxes that were already paid. So the city government, we're in good shape, but our people are hurting. They're unemployed. Um, certainly, they're not living from paycheck to paycheck anymore. They, they're not getting paychecks, huh. a lot of them. The unemployment yeah. has finally dipped under 10 percent, right. but we've been in the range of 15 or 16 percent. So yeah. uh, we really need yeah. the politicians in D.C. to put yeah. the Republican part and the Democratic yeah. part aside and help the people in America. Not a pretty picture. Thank you so much, Orlando Mayor Buddy Dyer. Coming up, we're going to have a second hour balance of power, and we'll be joined by Alan Greenspan, former chair of the Federal Reserve Board. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg. 